We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, later today, I'll be speaking with Scottish Enterprise, who are announcing that we had a record number of Scottish companies supported into new overseas markets last year by the international trade arm Scottish Development International. Uh, last year, SDI worked with 2,096 companies, a 50% increase from the previous year. This is expected to lead to an increase in export sales of £818 million over the next three years. And along with the excellent rise in job numbers yesterday, I'm sure these improving economic statistics will be welcomed by the whole chamber. No doubt we'll still have many disappointments uh, in the future, or it couldn't be otherwise in a recession. But these are excellent figures for the Scottish economy, which we all should welcome. Joanne Lawrence. Thank you. A packet of paracetamol costs 19 pence in Tesco. To dispense it on a free dis prescription, cost the NHS £3.10 per prescription. The NHS spends £7.2 million a year dispensing paracetamol. For that amount of money, 200 Scottish cancer patients could get cetuxapatmab to treat the condition for free for a year. While that treatment is free in England, Scots cancer patients have to pay around £3,000 a month for it. Does the First Minister think that is fair? First well, Minister. Could I, I remind Joanne Lamont that the Labour Party supported the, the move to free prescriptions in, in this chamber, in this Parliament. And if they want to reverse that policy, as many suspect to do in terms of the Cuts Commission's deliberations, then they should say clearly to the people of Scotland, yeah. and in particular to the up to 600,000 families earning £16,000 a year and less who had to pay for prescriptions under the previous system. In terms of the, the cancer drugs, it's a hugely uh, difficult and challenging issue. Uh, we can talk about that uh, a drug if Joanne Lamont wishes, but the position, incidentally, is not as she stated. Joanne Lamont. Everything in this world is not about an argument between the First Minister and I about manifestos. There are some things that are more important than that. is precisely the hugely challenging that government is about. Scots cancer patients are three times less likely to get the drugs they need on the Scottish NHS than patients in England, according to cancer charities. Scottish cancer patients have to pay thousands of pounds for vital, life-enhancing drugs which are available free south of the border. That means that some Scottish cancer victims are planning to uproot their families from their homes and communities to move to England for treatment they can't afford here. We are in danger of exporting health refugees. Order. Order. I, I absolutely agree that it is shameful. So I'm asking... So I am asking. Order. I agree. It is shameful. We are in danger of exporting health refugees. So, what is the First Minister's advice to those families? First Lovely. Minister. Can I deal with this in two ways? Firstly, on the specific question of Satoxa Samab. This was authorised by the Scottish Medicines Consortium in January 2010. The decision to restrict its use was the application from the pharmaceutical company Merrick Serona Limited, in quote from the SMC decision. The submitting company have requested that the SMC review have a niche within the licensed indication specifically for patients who had not previously received chemotherapy for their disease. The efficacy and safety data presented reflects this niche, and therefore for that it was approved by the Scottish Medicine Consortium, uh, very similar to the decision that was made by NICE uh, in England. Now, of course, it is the case that in England there is a Trans Cancer Drugs Fund, and people can apply to the Cancer Drugs Fund. But Satuximab is listed in the Cancer Drugs Fund, but only for specific conditions and restrictions on its use. We also know the Cancer Drug Fund 
is coming to an end next year in England and has been in recent weeks heavily restricted. We also know it has been heavily criticised, including by the cancer charities who challenged the idea of the Cancer Drugs Fund. And we also know that the Labour Party in this Parliament not only voted uh, for to remove prescription charges from Scotland, which was a good vote, but also voted against the idea of the Cancer Drugs Fund in this Parliament because of the challenges to that fund. Now, I know that John Lamont doesn't like to be reminded of these things, but in terms of tackling these extraordinarily difficult issues about access to medicines and what is the right thing to do, I think looking at the track record in this Parliament of people facing up to the inequality that prescription charges were imposing upon the Scottish people, and also what is the right way to, to put forward a, a medicines which can help people with life-limiting conditions, then the fact that the Labour Party agreed with this government, both in prescription charges and in an attitude to the Cancer Drugs Fund, puts John Lamont in an extraordinarily difficult position to pursue the line of questioning which he's now pursuing. Joanne Lamont. No, the extraordinarily difficult position that I am in is I am not able to address these problems. I can only ask the questions. I am not in government, and I am asking the first... Order. I am not in government. I have a responsibility... I have a responsibility to raise the difficult issues, which are hard, and I am asking... I am asking the First Minister not to retreat to the comfortable refuge of dealing with party politics, but focus on what is happening in the real world. Because, First Minister, with respect, this is not good enough for people like Maureen Fleming. She is a mother of three and a grandmother of ten, and she has bowel cancer. Maureen has been denied the drugs which her consultant says would improve her condition and extend her life. The Flemings are a proud family. They are struggling to get together the £10,000 needed for the first three months' treatment. But they can't afford to pay for any more after that, so they are planning to leave their home of 27 years and rent a flat in Newcastle, because in England they can get the drug for free. Time is short. So Maureen Fleming has come to this chamber today to hear firsthand what is the First Minister's advice to her and cancer victims like her. First Minister. As uh, Joanne Lamont will have noted, we had the review of the SMC process, which put forward a whole range of ways in which the SNP is effectively carrying out its job for the, the Scottish people. I can give uh, Joanne Lamont a list of uh, drugs which are available in Scotland because of the efficiency of the SNP process, which is not available in England. But as far as the Cancer Drugs Fund, this chamber and indeed the cancer charities in Scotland decided that was not the right way to go. We also know that the Cancer Drug Fund comes to an end in England next year. In Scotland, we have an efficient process which I think would be very unwise to challenge in terms of the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Uh, and its effectiveness is widely admired in terms of the rapidity and quickness in which it, uh, it judges and evaluates drugs. It is capable of improvement, which is quite why the Routledge Review has carried forward that. Uh, but we also have the individual patient request system, where people can apply in terms of the individual nature of their condition. And we know also that improvements can be made to that system as well. But uh, you know, John Lamont accuses me of, of playing party politics. Uh, but John Lamont introduced this in the party political way. And it is perfectly reasonable to point out both on prescription charges and on our attitude to the Cancer Drugs Fund that the Labour Party agreed with our judgment that it is the best way to deliver health to the Scottish people. So in these extraordinarily difficult circumstances, we are trying to judge a position which gives the best treatment to the people of Scotland. That is the basis on which we put forward the SMC, which we put forward the individual patient requests. Uh, and it is not the case that there are a simple or easy solution to these matters. These are judged in the best way we possibly can, and it is done, as I hope every member of this chamber does, with a, a genuine wish to protect the welfare and health of patients in Scotland. Joanne Lamont. 
I mean, I regret that in all of that, the First Minister has not addressed the question I posed to him. Because Mrs Fleming represents a failure in the system. And while we are thinking and deliberating about how in future we might address this problem, it is the business of government to address what's happening to families now who do not have time to wait. Because we are talking about the real lives of real Scots. I will engage in the policy debate, but I urge the First Minister to act now for those people who are being failed for the system. Because the First Minister and I agree that the NHS should be free at the point of need. But the reality is, isn't it the case that in the First Minister of Scotland, if you have a headache, your prescription is free, but if you have cancer, your prescription can cost £3,000 a month? Isn't it the case that in this Scotland, Scots with hay fever, can get the prescriptions for free, but Scots with cancer may have to leave their homeland for the treatment to save their lives. First Minister. When the, this administration abolished the prescription charges, we were in a minority in this Parliament. If the Labour Party and General Anne Lamont wanted to stop that and didn't think it was the right move, then they could have stopped it by voting against it. In fact, they supported it. And they supported it, I hope and believe, because they felt that for that range of 600,000 Scots and £16,000 a year and less, it was the right thing to do. If the Labour Party felt that a cancer drugs fund was the right policy to have, then they could have supported a cancer drugs fund in this Parliament. But they agreed with us and the cancer charities that that wasn't the right or proportionate thing to do. There are always improvements that can be made to the system, but the SMC process is a robust and effective system. It's doing the absolute best it can, and we're making improvements. The individual patient request is a good system. Uh, and that is why we are trying to standardise it across uh, the, the nation in terms of looking at the particular aspects of individual patients. But, but to pretend to people that there is a, a solution to these hugely difficult questions which are being faced by every health service across the world in terms of the efficacy of what drugs can be approved for use is misleading people entirely. And to pretend to people that the situation in England is either continuing, which it's not, or is satisfactory at the present moment is also wrong. And the last thing I'd say to Jan Lamont, uh, and I've got uh, every consideration and respect for the individual cases, and we've all had constituents in that position, that's how it's done. But we have to look with some regard at some of the information that's placed out by drugs companies in this matter. There was a statement from Roche last week which argued that there was uh, the drugs uh, tourism that uh, Joanne Lamont referred to. We should reflect on the fact that that drug that Roche were particularly concerned about, when it came to the Scottish Medical Consortium, they did not offer the discount on Avastin and the patient access scheme that they were asked to. This is from Roche Pharmaceutical Division, who have got an operating profit of £10.9 billion this year. So just occasionally, in terms of trying to overcome the difficulty of these issues, perhaps we should ask the drugs companies, like Roche, why they're not prepared to offer to the Scottish people these effective drugs at a reasonable price, which would allow more of them to be approved. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans near future. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, last year we had the embarrassing pantomime of the First Minister pretending to have legal advice on an independent Scotland's relationship with the EU and fighting his way through the courts to guard its contents, only for us all to find that no such advice existed. They'd made it up to cover the fact that everything this government said about the EU was based on little more than wishful thinking. Then, in October, Order. we had the Deputy First Minister promising this chamber that she would tell us how much it finally cost taxpayers for that aborted action. But as of this morning, that information has still not been lodged. So I'll ask again, how much public money was spent on a pointless action to prevent the publication of legal advice which never existed? First Minister. I, I, I have to say, okay. I accused uh, Willie Rennie of uh, kamikaze tactics last week. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to talk about Europe and the phrase embarrassing pantomime. <laughs> in, in, 
In the wake of a performance in the House of Commons uh, where her ally in the leader of the Liberal Democrats, who I should give another mention to because he doesn't get a question today, who, who said that the Prime Minister had taken leave of his senses, and that is their allies in the coalition government, I, I think takes the most uh, extraordinary a degree of bravado for which I, I congratulate Ruth Davidson. In terms of the cost of action, a, a mere fraction of the inflated cost that Ruth Davidson suggested uh, last year, uh, and she'd do well not to make these grandiose claims in the future. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. In terms of barefaced bravado, when even the SNP's own voters are more interested in holding a referendum on Europe than in voting for independence, I think the First Minister goes some himself. So, Despite being promised seven months ago for that information, oh, it's sir. still being kept secret. We don't have that. But last night we heard from another one uh, of the ministers of this government who says that at last Scottish government legal advice on the EU does actually exist. Now, on the basis that she wasn't pretending, uh, the First Minister needs to tell the people of Scotland what that advice contains. Last year, the Information Commissioner ruled that we had a right to know on this critical issue, and vague promises of edited highlights in a far-off white paper just won't cut it. So, is the First Minister once again going to go through the costly farce of fighting in the courts to stop the people of Scotland knowing the truth, or will he finally reveal what the Information Commissioner says he should? First Minister. That's actually not what the Information Commissioner ruled at all. I suggest you go back to have a look at her ruling. Uh, but what we'll do, see when you request uh, specific legal advice from the law officers, it's quite normal to then receive it. This is no great, <coughs> this is no great surprise. Uh, and in terms of going forward, Order. what we'll do is exactly what the Deputy First Minister said on the 23rd of October 2012, but the Government's position in the Independence White Paper will be based on and consistent with the advice that we've received. Now, can I remind Ruth Davidson, that the UK Government haven't published advice from the law officers. That's not been done. The UK Government have published legal advice from an eminent expert, uh, Professor James Crawford. Now, in terms of eminent experts, we now have a large selection of eminent experts who can opine on the Scottish Government's position of negotiating from within the context of the European Union and that our timescale of 18 months is a reasonable timescale for the successful completion of these negotiations. And we could cite Sir David Edward, the British Judge of the European Court of Justice, Graeme Avery, Honorary Director General of the European Commission, Lord Malloch Brown, a Minister in the last Labour Government, and only yesterday John Bruton, the former Taoiseach and EU Ambassador to the United States. Or we could have Professor of David Sheffer, who said exactly the same thing. But perhaps the absolutely clinching view that you could negotiate your position from within and 18 months was a reasonable time sale should come from the UK Government's own chosen legal advisor, Professor James Crawford. Asked on the Today programme on this precise question, he replied, well, the Scottish estimate is about 18 months and that seems realistic. So now that we have this huge consensus of legal experts, up to and including even the UK government's expert, can the Ruth Davis not bring herself to join the consensus <laughs> and not engage in the fractious dispute that the Tory party are pursuing at Westminster? Question number three, John Wilson. Officer, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with Vattenfall regarding its investments in offshore wind energy projects. First Minister. Well, Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Development International have held discussions with Vattenfall and a number of other interested parties regarding offshore wind energy projects. In relation to the European Offshore Wind Development Centre in Aberdeen Bay, Vattenfall has continued to develop the scheme alongside its project partners, the Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group and Technique Offshore Wind, and has stated it is confident of securing new investment in the project. John Wilson. I thank the First Minister for his reply. Can the First Minister indicate what estimates the Scottish Government and its agencies have made of the benefits of the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre as a driver for jobs and investment in the supply chain in Scotland? First Minister. Well, the, the Offshore Development Centre, of course, will produce employment. I mean, 265, I think, is the uh, estimate in the construction phase, 25 jobs in the operation phase. But the purpose of the, the Offshore Development Centre is not as a, a wind farm 
as uh, is often said. It, it's a deployment centre to test new offshore wind technologies. That's why there's only 11 turbines in the proposed development. And the significance of the development is exactly that, is to put the Scotland and, the, in this case, Aberdeen as a, an energy capital in a central position in the development of that exciting new technology. Now, that technology, that is deep offshore wind in Scotland, is estimated, of course, to be able to provide tens of thousands of jobs in Scotland because it's a technology that's going to be necessary for the energy needs, not just of Scotland, not just of England, but of the European continent. Ken McIntosh. Thank you. As the First Minister rightly says, the offshore uh, wind deployment centre is very important for the uh, future of uh, Scotland's offshore industry. Can I ask the, minister, uh, the First Minister, if Vattenfall are unable to sell their shares, will he step in to secure its future? First Minister. Well, I saw the Labour Party spokesperson, his colleague in Aberdeen, suggest that we should match that the funding, which of course the Green Energy Centre established by the Scottish Government secured from the European Union, of €40 million. Euros. And I would like to know if that's actually another Labour Party spending commitment. Are they actually saying that €40 million Euros to be spent uh, from the Scottish Government. This is a, a commercial project supported by the 40 million European uh, investment secured by the initiative of the Scottish Government through the Green Energy Centre. The project partners are confident that they will be able to secure interest in the project, and why shouldn't they? Because there are many, many companies interested in the development of deep offshore wind in Scotland. But Ken McIntosh should really come to this chamber if he's proposing a spending commitment of the many, many spending commitments. Well, he says he was only asking the question. His colleague in Aberdeen wasn't he asking the question. He was making a recommendation. So if that is the policy of the Labour Party, then perhaps you could square it with the other priorities, like the one that Joanne Lamont brought to me earlier on today. Question number four, Christine Graham. And thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the use of electronic tagging of offenders as an alternative to short-term sentences. First Minister. Well, there's very strong evidence that community sentences are an effective alternative to short prison uh, sentences, and that's very clear. 58% of offenders in prison for three months or less are reconvicted within a year, compared with only 24% of those who receive a community sentence. Now, electronic monitoring has been used in Scotland since 2002. It continues to play a significant part in offender management. We are consulting this summer on the possible development of the electronic monitoring service to include satellite tracking of offenders. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you. I thank the First Minister for his response. Is the First Minister aware that in Sweden, anyone given six months or less can apply to be tagged at home under house arrest while being monitored? Any breach and they've returned to jail and that reoffending fell to 12%. The cost to the taxpayer is some £40 per day and not the £165 per day for a prison place. Given the success of tagging there over 20 years, would the First Minister consider following the Swedish model? First Minister. I to learn about practice in other jurisdictions. In fact, last week the Government supported and chaired the event at Strathclyde University, which heard from the head of the Swedish Probation Service, and he outlined how their system operates. Now, many of the characteristics of the Swedish system are already in place in Scotland, but the consultation on electronic monitoring this summer will be an opportunity to formally capture any options for improvements, uh, as although we have the lowest crime rate in 37 years, we are always keen to and continue to improve wherever we can. Michael MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I hope you're feeling well. I wonder if the First Minister has had a chance to look in on the debate that we had here on Tuesday, because in that, people that he himself has classified as offenders were split into two camps, those who had electronic tags and could vote in an election, and those who had a custodial for the same crime, more or less, and could not vote. I wonder if he agrees with me that there's a matter of equity here that we should look at. First Minister. Well, I, I read the proceedings of the, the debate, actually, and I, I thought it was a, an excellent debate on all sides as various arguments were put forward. But for myself, I agree with the majority position that was taken in the debate. I think when people engage in crime and receive a prison sentence, then they sacrifice some of their entitlements, the entitlement to freedom, and also, I believe, quite rightly, the entitlement to vote. That's the position I take. But I thought it was a, a good debate on the subject, uh, which I think did the Parliament proud in terms of how it was conducted. Question number five, Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to tackle bullying in the National Health Service. First Minister. 
Well, in 2011, we worked with health boards and trade unions to develop the new preventing and dealing with bullying and harassment a policy, which sets out a new minimum standard for ensuring that all members of National Health Service staff are treated fairly and consistently. In addition, the National Confidential Alert Line went live on the 2nd of April this year, providing a further source of advice and support for staff who fear they may be bullied or are raising concerns about the health service, to report these concerns in confidence and to be reassured that health boards will listen. Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the First Minister for that answer. The First Minister is right to um, is frequently praises um, and thanks hard working staff for their dedication, and he's right to do so. But according to RCN, less than a third of nurses believe if they reported their concerns, they would be believed. Um, any suggestion of a culture of management bullying is completely unacceptable, whether it's in specific workplaces or, or more widely, particularly when it would th threaten robust whistleblowing procedures, which we know to be absolutely necessary. So, in light of reports that one in four NHS staff have been subject to bullying and that in the Scottish Ambulance Service more than a third of staff say they have been a victim of bullying, will the First Minister undertake to ensure that the new National uh, Whistleblowing Helpline, which he mentioned, is publicised more widely? And will he, for example, agree that the telephone number should be printed on all National Health Service payslips? First Minister? I, I think the member should be a bit careful with uh, the statistics he is using. That, uh, the 2010, for example, staff survey showed that 22 per cent of staff believed that the previous 12 months they had been bullied or harassed, but 31 per cent of that was from service users uh, or relatives of service users. And I think it is quite important to understand uh, the terms of the statistics. I agree, and that is why we have introduced for the first time a, a, a confidential alert line. Uh, I do not agree with Jackie Bailey, who seemed to suggest in the radio last week that such a thing was not necessary under the great days of the – well, Jackie Bailey did suggest that in the radio last week, and I have got the, quote, the extraordinary quote here which suggests it. I think far more productively, given that this has just been introduced, is how it is being publicised. It was introduced on the 25th of March that the flyers and posters – 158,000 credit card flyers and 5,000 posters were issued to the health boards on that date uh, to promote the alert line. And it's certainly true we, we are planning a incur further promotion of the National Confidential Line throughout the year, making sure staff are aware of this confidential resource. Uh, and I'm sure the member will be delighted to know that includes messages on NHS payslips. Yeah. Question number six, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government is having with local authorities regarding access to Gaelic medium schools. First Minister. Well, the, the Scottish Government hosted the First Ministerial Summit on Gaelic medium education on the 20th of February this year. It was attended by all local authorities that provide Gaelic medium education and leading educationalists. The Minister for Scotland's Languages, Alistair Allen, announced at the summit £90,000 to fund further summer schools in Gaelic communities for trainee teachers, new research on how best to support pupils with additional needs, and the development of prelim exam papers in Gaelic. Ms Smith, uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Would he agree with many in the Gaelic community who feel very strongly that the priority, the urgent priority, should be addressing the concerns of teacher training, uh, both in terms of uh, the employment of teachers in Gaelic medium education and their retention in areas where there is the highest demand, rather than insisting local authorities spend a lot of their resources in areas where there is no demand? First Minister. Yeah, yeah, this, I, I, I do agree with that, which is why I answered Liz Smith in the way, in the way that I did. And she also should know the, the new uh, posts in the University of Highlands and Islands uh, and Gaelic teacher training, which I think are very effective as well. And I hope that all members, uh, and I know they did because I was asking, took advantage of the, uh, of the promotion of uh, Gaelic education, Gaelic medium education, which has been in this Parliament uh, uh, this week. And I think we should also be delighted uh, to see the indications from public uh, opinion surveys, which, contrary to the view which is uh, sometimes uh, put forward in some of our less reputable organs of the press, that there is this great reservoir of discontent about the promotion of our national, uh, one of our national languages of, of Gaelic, there actually is widespread public support, both for Gaelic medium education and indeed for BBC Alapa, which has achieved such outstanding audience figures of over 500,000 people on many occasions, which is a spectacular achievement and should be celebrated by everyone in this chamber. That ends First Minister's question. I will now allow a short pause to allow members who are not participating in the members' debate to leave and for the public gallery to clear before we move on to that members' debate.